Hey, this is Doc G, and we are going to have conversations that help you earn and invest in your future so you can make the right decisions today. On this episode, we're going to discuss artisanal banks. What? You haven't heard of them? Well, maybe you've heard them by their other name, credit unions. I usually start these episodes by telling a story, giving a tale about how the conversation we're going to have today relates to my everyday life. I'm not going to do that today. And the reason why is that in reality, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about my banking options. Even less, truth be told, on credit unions. But maybe, just maybe, that's a mistake. And speaking of credit unions and financial independence, where do you go or send people when you want them to learn more about the financial independence retire early community? Well, I send people over to phiology.com. That's F I O L O G Y.com. My friend David Boyer created the site for the FIRE community. He includes his 52 FIology lessons, which you can get in your inbox one a week, as well as his free FIology workbook. There are a bunch of other great resources. Check it out, phiology.com. That's F-I-O-L-O-G-Y.com. Gigi Highland is the executive director for the National Credit Union Foundation, which is the national philanthropic arm of America's credit union movement. And Mike Shank is the Deputy Chief Advocacy Officer for Policy Analysis and Chief Economist and conducts economic research and supports the Credit Union National Associations, or CUNA's, public relations and advocacy efforts. Mike and Gigi, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. I am really excited to talk to you guys today about credit unions. I feel like before we have this conversation, we have to differentiate better the difference between banks and credit unions. I am shamefully have to admit that before researching this episode, I didn't have a clear idea or wasn't very clear on what differentiates the two. So tell us a little bit about the differences. Sure. Thanks for asking. So I think you really have to start at the foundation of what credit unions are in terms of a model for providing financial services. Credit unions are not-for-profit financial cooperatives. So if your listeners think about the cooperatives maybe that they're familiar with, Land O'Lakes, potentially, REI, places where you are a member, where you are an owner, Credit unions are exactly that, but they provide financial services. So they are, again, not-for-profit, first and foremost. They are cooperatives, which means that really the way they do business is that the member, you join a credit union just like you would join REI with maybe a $5 share. You're a member, and the credit union really works to provide financial services for you as a member. They are democratically owned and operated. So uh, you and I, as members of a credit union, can actually vote for our board of directors. We can run for the board of directors. And credit unions really are very focused on on taking the profit, I'm going to put that in air quotes, the profit that they earn, and reinvesting that back into the products and services that they provide for members. But also what that means typically is lower rates on loans and higher rates on savings obviously depending on the economy, but everything is sort of churned back into the cooperative for the benefit of members. So that's a really high level view of the difference between banks and credit unions. We can go a little deeper if you'd like, but that's the the, the two minute version. Mike, I want to come back to this idea of lower rates for various services, but f- before we do, talk to us a little bit about the non-for-profit status and how that affects its members. Well, there, there are a couple of different effects, but the one of the most dramatic ones is the fact that these financial benefits that accrue are really significant. So because credit unions, unlike banks, don't have outside stockholders demanding a market rate of return on their investment, they can take the profits that they earn and turn them back over to their member owners. And as Gigi mentioned, they do that uh, by delivering loans in the marketplace at lower rates and higher yields on savings accounts, and also fewer and lower fees for the most part. We estimate that uh, that benefit nationally 
totals about $14 billion annually. And to put that in more concrete terms, if you were to look at sort of the average interest rate on an automobile loan at a bank and compare it to the average interest rate on an automobile loan at a credit union, what you would find is that difference is so significant that it results in roughly $1,000 in savings over the course of, a say, a five-year car loan. So that's one example of how an individual might save a lot of money. Yeah, it's just from a financial perspective, it's that, but it's also the fact that, you know, you do, as an owner, you do have an ownership interest that allows you to participate in the governance and the strategic direction of the institution that you belong to. And that's pretty powerful. Gigi, as I did research on credit unions, the one thing I was really struck by was this arm of financial education. And it really seemed to be different than general banking institutions. Talk about the educational goal of credit unions for its members. Right. So credit unions, like every other cooperative in the world, actually abides by a set of cooperative principles. And those principles, one of those principles is this idea of of educating members and the idea of fostering an understanding of members' financial lives. So there's really almost every credit union, I would say, in the United States does something around financial education. How do I actually figure out how to borrow money to buy a car? How do I actually figure out what it takes to own a home? How do I think about retiring safely? How do I think about caring for maybe an elderly parent that needs Care. This idea of meeting members where they are in life and providing the education to help them, maybe just in time, meet that sort of educational need to really be able to make an informed and appropriate decision for that particular member. And so it really is this idea of education and understanding finances is really built into the DNA of a credit union based on the fact that they are cooperative. And Gigi, I've heard before you talk on interviews of the difference between financial education and financial literacy. They're different things. Well, they are. And probably what you've heard me say is a lot about financial well-being. So there's this idea that, you know, Dr. G, if I said to you, I'm going to help you with your financial literacy, it's almost a slam right from from the beginning. It assumes that you are financially illiterate. And it's not a great place to start a conversation around improving your financial well-being, which might be, you know, I have a dream, you have a dream, let's say, you know, to move to, I don't know, the Swiss Alps and live there for five years. How do you do that financially? It's this idea of where do you, where is the member? What education does that member really need to achieve whatever his or her financial dreams are that then lead to this idea of financial well-being where the member has the ability to make the choices that give that member financial freedom to reach his or her goals, to have control over his or her finances day in, day out, and then to to have the capacity to be able to manage their money day in and day out. So there's a lot in there, but just kind of throwing a budgeting course or just throwing information about compound interest and how you calculate it onto a website is the starting point, but it's really, it's a longer journey than that. So financial literacy, financial education is really important but it's this more longitudinal work that credit unions are doing around financial well-being that really, I think, is a differentiator, honestly, one of the differentiators. My Gigi talks about financial well-being, and this is an interesting time in our history. We came out of the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and then in this last year, we've been hit with what I'd call a pandemic recession How has this idea of financial well-being changed, and how are credit unions stepping up to deal with that? Well, I don't know that the idea has changed all that much uh, in the in the current crisis, but uh, credit unions are sort of uniquely qualified to be in this space at this time. Credit unions were created in the early 1900s, and they were very successful at delivering. Uh, the products and services and the advice that average consumers needed when average consumers really didn't have a lot of access to credit. There were a number of financial hiccups in the early 1900s, and it became really obvious that the credit union difference was something that really mattered to people. And by that, I mean one of the differences in ownership that 
produces desirable pro-social results is the idea that because you're a member of a credit union and because there are no outside stockholders, our view is squarely on you as an individual, on our members, not on these outside stockholders. And so what that means, especially in crisis situations, is that for-profit institutions are focused on defending shareholder value. That's, that's what their, their, their main goal is to deliver value to their shareholders, not to their customers. Credit unions, by contrast, don't have those shareholders. And so they're firmly focused on delivering value to members. And in crisis situations, what that means is getting people as quickly through crisis as possible and with as little disruption as possible. And, and in, nine, in the early 1930s, Congress recognized this credit union difference, enacted the Credit Union Act, which basically uh, was a federal credit union charter. In every subsequent crisis, we see the pro-social behaviors that I just described. And so, for example, coming out of the Great Recession, we saw credit union lending throughout that entire recession in the context of a for-profit sector that was hunkered down, that was pulling back, licking its wounds, and was very reluctant to be lending into the marketplace. So, and we see that now in the COVID crisis as well. Credit unions have remained in the marketplace, continue to lend. We have been very active with the, the payment protection program loans, paycheck protection loans, and really are squarely focused on helping Main Street mom and pop businesses there. We've done uh, almost every credit union in the United States has engaged in loan forbearance activity, have, has engaged in activities like you know recalculating payments and that sort of thing. A number of uh, a large number, a large percentage of credit unions have actually put new programs into place to help people get through. So it's not just financial value; it's actually a difference in behavior that results from that cooperative structure that's really important and especially in crisis. And just to continue to put a fine point on what Mike is saying, you know, I think what's really interesting historically is to realize that credit unions were really born of crisis. So. You know, in 1908, you have our first credit union, St. Mary's Bank, um, up in, in Manchester, New Hampshire, that was responding to the need of French Canadian immigrants that needed to have another choice that was not uh, a, a loan shark choice, because that was the only choice for finances at that point in time. And so St. Mary's Bank was created to essentially provide affordable loans for those French Canadian immigrant mill workers to have a better place to save, a better place to borrow. And Mike referenced the fact that in 1934, FDR signed the Federal Credit Union Act into place smack in the middle of the Great Depression when you have people, again, that are looking to have funds to be able to start businesses and to make it through this horrible financial time. And time after time, crisis after crisis, as Mike noted, you have credit unions really stepping up. And to add to the stories that Mike added about what we just dealt with in 2020 and what we continue to deal with in 2021, you know, credit unions, in addition to all of the things that Mike mentioned, the loan forbearances, the skip of pay, uh, the reworking of, of financial obligations, the consolidation of debt, you know, credit unions have also gone out into their community and really looked to see how they could partner with nonprofits or actually offer the ability to have potentially a food bank within their own four walls for their own employees. I mean, just incredibly creative ideas to really, again, meet members where they are in life and figure out how they can help get members through what right now is just this, you know, colossal perfect storm of a health crisis and an economic crisis. Mike, it sounds like this idea of stepping into the breach and crisis management is part of the DNA of credit unions. We talked about the non-for-profit status. We talked about the membership. What else about credit unions makes it so agile at these difficult times? A couple of things. One is that, as Gigi described, credit unions sort of in their DNA are very consultative. So they, their, their approach is to interact with members, not because there's a profit to be made on the business that we do with those members, but because we're trying to help them. So there's there's a much more of a, of a, a focus on consultation and education on the one hand. The other thing about credit unions is that generally speaking, they're relatively small and they're local. 
And what that means is uh, quite often is that, for example, credit decisions are being made locally, not in a corporate office three or four states over. And that introduces a lot more flexibility into that example of the loan process than otherwise would exist at most other financial institutions. And so it, it's not simply about making a loan or making profit, but it's, it's you know, really trying to understand where people are coming from and doing whatever we can to help them out. So Gigi, let's talk about where we are today. I've heard you quote the statistic that 78% of the U.S. is living paycheck to paycheck right now, and 40% of the U.S. couldn't handle an unexpected $400 expense. What's going on in America today, and, and what is what are credit unions doing to help? Right. Well, I'm sure you've seen all the statistics that we're all seeing nationally, which is, you know, you have millions of people who are unemployed. You have folks that are earning income through a gig economy and have income volatility. You have folks that have significant amount of medical debt, whether they've just dealt with COVID or whether they've had another event happen in their life that has caused them to have to pay out of pocket for health care, even if they are well insured through an employer. So you've got this, again, this kind of perfect storm of a health event which has shut off the the flow of income for so many people. And those statistics that you just cited, you know, are continuing to to be in place and they haven't haven't changed, if you will. You know, people are still living paycheck to paycheck. They're still incredibly financially fragile. So as we think about, and, and this is what Mike referenced, the basics of financial being in a way haven't changed. It's just There's like a a mega spotlight now on the financial fragility that most families have. And so I think for credit unions, this uh, continues to be an opportunity that credit unions are really trying to meet through uh, a lot of financial coaching. I mean, a lot of credit unions have financial coaches on on staff or they they collaborate with folks like Green Path or Balance to organizations that have financial coaches to really work through where, where is the person, what are the pain points that a person is going through? What's the real story behind why Gigi Highland cannot pay her mortgage this particular month? And what's going on to find a way to be able to, again, get people through this financial crisis and, and the pandemic? So in a way, all of the basics haven't changed. It's simply applying those same kind of thoughts about how you advance people's financial well-being and credit unions systematically and methodically going through that so they can help member by member try to weather through. Mike, what are you seeing on the street? I've heard the recovery from this recession described as a K-shaped recovery. So those who are in the higher economic tiers have been doing very well, yet those who were at the substance level to begin with are struggling to recover at the same rate. Is that what you're seeing in your local credit union, in your local credit unions around the country? Absolutely. You know, with 125 million memberships nationally, credit union members are broadly representative of the U.S. population. So whatever's happening nationally is really reflected in credit union memberships. There's no question about it. And the other thing is that of course, the pandemic really did magnify and accelerate a bunch of changes that we were watching prior to the start of the pandemic, right? So, for example, most economists and market analysts were very closely watching what was happening with retail. And, you know, the, the idea of the Amazon effect was something that was being discussed pretty widely because jobs in that industry were really under a lot of pressure. Well, the pandemic hit and and that was magnified and it was accelerated dramatically. So there are roughly, for example, 11 million or so people employed in leisure and hospitality. So that would be restaurants and hotels, amusement parks, that, that type of thing. These are folks that don't earn a lot of money. And the jobs that they have really do require them to interact face-to-face with other people. So it, it really does put them on the front lines and and expose them to a whole heck of a lot of risk. So they're not making a lot of money to begin with. In April of this year, the people that were employed in that industry alone were out of work in record numbers. The number of people employed in leisure and hospitality fell by 49% by April. 
Now, as the economies opened up, we saw improvement. There's no question about that. As recently as November, the, the percentage that were that dropped relative to pre-pandemic was about 20.2%. In December, that actually increased to 23%, a little bit over 23%. So there's, there's this huge disconnect in terms of employment in that industry, and it has improved, but it's still unprecedented by historical norms. So that's a really big deal. And so the, the bottom line on that, it's one example, but the bottom line on this is that we've been watching for most of the last 30 years, a steady increase in financial inequality, no matter how you measure it, whether it's income inequality or, or inequality re relative to net worth or wealth disparity, it's more obvious today. There's no question, the data shows that federal fiscal stimulus has helped. There's no question that, you know, the, the sweetened unemployment benefits early on in the crisis, that helped. More people had money to pay their bills and some people actually were able to save a little bit more than they otherwise would have. So that's great, that's the headline. When you start to dig down into the data though, what we see across income, across gender, across race, race and ethnicity, is that those disparities that have been growing for 30 years are growing in the pandemic. And this is a huge issue because this represents a big chunk of the population. Gigi, what Mike is describing is the wealth disparity. And most of us look and say, these are systemic problems that probably have to do with legislation. As someone who's a big part of the philanthropic portion of credit unions, how do you as a credit union or how do we as a group of credit unions help deal with these systemic problems on a personal basis? How do we help the small business owners and the members deal with something that maybe you can't truly change without major legislation? Well, I think the simple answer is probably creativity. In the philanthropic space, there's been a lot of activism from family foundations, from you know, large foundations that are looking to essentially infuse the cash assistance necessary into households, particularly households of color and particularly low income households to simply get them, and I say simply, simply get them the cash they need to weather through um, this pandemic. And so I think of the creativity of, of credit unions, and I'm thinking particularly now of, of neighborhood trust, federal credit union, uh, that worked actually on some cash assistance programs with funders and with a, a nonprofit called Saver Life to actually provide through a credit union account the infusion of a cash assistance to let those families and let those households be able to you know, get sort of another month or two down the, down the road through this economic crisis. So I think most importantly is this idea of credit unions thinking as creatively as possible with their nonprofit partners, with the philanthropies that they support to find ways to what I call bring all of those superpowers together to really help members with what they're dealing with. I think of, you know, some of our credit unions in the Northwest, you know, wrestling with the idea of affordable housing and how do you find philanthropic ways to support making sure that, you know, first responders and teachers all have the housing that they need close to where they work so they don't have to commute two or three hours, you know, each, almost each way during the day. I think of our colleagues in Maine that are trying to eradicate food insecurity in the state of Maine, which is the largest, has the highest level of food insecurity in the Northeast. These, these sort of beyond the walls of the financial institution activities, which actually deeply affect people's financial well-being and finding ways to, to leverage what a credit union does well with what others do well to, to make a difference in their communities and make a difference for members. Gigi, does the term financial equity come up a lot as part of the philanthropic arm of the credit union associations? It, it does, you know, certainly with the horrific murder of George Floyd and with all of the civil unrest that, that happened in 2020 that continues to, to happen. And as Mike mentioned, 
um, working, working with this idea of how do we systemically make these changes, but then also how do we look for biases? How do we look for the opportunities within our own shops and our own work to make sure that that we eradicate slowly but surely this idea of financial inequity, that we level the playing field so that all people, regardless of their color, their gender, um, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, can all achieve financial well-being because we are all should have that ability and finding a way to be able to do that is really, really, I think, at the heart of what credit unions are, again, based on the principles that, that govern Mike, previously you mentioned the fiscal stimulus and how it is one way that we're dealing with the COVID pandemic and the associated recession. What is the role of the credit union in helping its members use and understand the fiscal stimulus that has come down the road this last year and and may come in the future? I think one of the most important things that I'm hearing from our members is that they're being very careful to make sure that members understand that this is a stopgap thing. This is, this is not the answer to their problems. You know, I think that in terms of, uh, you know, when my, when my kids were young, if they were hungry, I might give them a candy bar. Well, it, ha- it had a great effect. They had a lot of energy for a really short period of time, but more than likely they weren't feeling so, feeling so great an hour later. And certainly there wasn't a lot of nutrition in that candy bar. That's kind of what's going on here. What we need to do is think about, you know, healthy options and improving the long-term outlook for these folks. And that has been a consistent focus amongst all of the institutions that, that I talk to. Particularly with this last round of stimulus money, you know, credit unions, I think, are, are focused on, again, this long-term financial well-being of their members, to use the candy bar analogy, is, you know, how do you think about how to help members save with part of the stimulus money? How do you help those that are eligible for the earned income tax credit to really leverage that and understand the language of the new stimulus law that allows people to look back to their income in 2019 and not to to use 2020 so that they can get that tax refund? I think, as, as you know, probably tax refunds for most people are the largest infusion of cash that they will get throughout the year. And there's a lot of great research that shows that when people get that cash, They pay for deferred things like maybe bills that are due, maybe deferred health care, like going to a dentist or getting a mammogram. So how do in 2021, how do credit unions help their members really understand the nuances, particularly of the second stimulus package, to be able to leverage those to continue to bolster the financial well-being of of households? So just add that as some specific examples of, of what credit unions are thinking about and doing as they offer volunteer income tax preparation as tax time starts to come up. Those, those nuances that really can help members uh, in the long run. And it's, and it's not just financial health. You know, I think credit unions are having deep conversations with members around the idea that your financial health has a huge effect on your physical health and on your mental health. And, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a snowball, right? And uh, once that snowball starts rolling down the hill, uh, it's really easy to get further and further behind and end up with a bunch of problems that are bigger and bigger. And so, you know, I've I've actually talked to a lot of credit unions that are having deep conversations around, you know, how do you stay physically healthy in, in this stressful situation? How do you stay mentally healthy in a situation that, you know, has disconnected us in so many ways? And so I think that's, that's one of the really neat things about credit unions. It really is a holistic approach to, to uh, interactions with members. It's not simply focused on you know how, how many dollars you can make in profit. In the first half of the show, Mike and Gigi discuss the difference between banks and credit unions. After the break, we delve into how credit unions are in the well-being business. But first, here on the Earn and Invest podcast, we are not in the business of promoting other podcasts. On the other hand, there's one that stands out that I really want to talk to you about today. My friend Chad Carson has the Real Estate and Financial Independence podcast. He has weekly episodes with practical advice about using real estate to retire early and do more of what matters. 
Chad is known as the coach or Coach Carson, and this moniker fits him so well because he is the guy you go to when you need to figure out which play comes next. He offers two types of advice. One are the episodes where he breaks down a subject and goes in depth by himself. The other is he has real life practical advice from people who are going through it now. His interviews are with people who are living the real estate life. They're using it to retire early and they can give you the tricks and tips to make it work. It's the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. You can find it at coachcarson.com or go to wherever you are listening to this podcast and look him up. You won't regret it. Gigi, it really gets back to this whole idea of well-being that we talked about before. It goes much farther than just financial health. And so it sounds like credit unions are really trying to provide a more holistic approach than we would find in other institutions that provide banking services. I think that's true. And I think, you know, it's, I think it's starting. I think you see more and more credit unions that are making, you know, this link between how, how a member is, is doing physically and emotional with the impact that that has on, on finances. I mean, there's lots of information research around, you know, people spending a good three hours at work during a week thinking about their finances and worrying about their finances and the impact that that has on the quality of work that that person is providing for his or her employer. I mean, so this, you cannot separate the person and have just their financial life sort of in one silo and the rest of their life in another silo. They're all deeply connected. We know that money is incredibly emotional. We learn that as as we grow up and we have experiences, but You know, I remember a quote from a great community health survey that was done in Rochester, New York, where they asked folks about what more could the community health system do. And one gentleman answered, you know, if you really want to lower my blood pressure, help me pay my electricity bill. This idea that there's this profound intertwining of how I navigate my financial life and really what it does to me physically. So there are a variety of credit unions around the country that are really are, are starting to really focus on this or doing philanthropic efforts that focus on this. Mike, are the members surprised by this a little bit? I mean, when you walk into a traditional bank, the last thing you expect they're going to be concentrating on is your physical health. Is it surprising to your members that it's having this more holistic approach? I think it's surprising to new members. And the really neat thing about what we've talked about, you know, the fact that credit unions do view their capital as more or less a war chest to be used, not used up, but to be used during tough times, does mean that there's meaningful engagement with people. And what we found consistently coming out of crisis, I've been through three crises now, the savings and loan crisis, the Great Recession, and now this one. In the previous two that I lived through, and if you go back further in time, what you find is that credit union memberships grow and grow strongly in the wake of these dislocations. And I believe the reason for that is that credit union members recognize that credit unions behave differently, that credit unions do engage while others are turning their backs and they tell their friends. And the friends come, in in the wake of the Great Recession, credit unions were recording membership growth overall annually in the neighborhood of four, five, six, seven percent, and five, six times the rate of U.S. population growth, basically. And, and I think it was a direct result of two things. One, the fact that credit unions did not saddle consumers with inappropriate mortgages during the formation of the real estate bubble. And secondly, as that crisis progressed, we stepped in and helped people. So that is really different relative to what we see in the for-profit sector and people do increasingly recognize it and will increasingly recognize it coming out of the, the current crisis. If, if history is a good guy, I think it will be. Yeah, I think back to the real estate bubble and this idea that an institution was stepping in and infusing cash seems almost unheard of. So to hear you say that really does point to some of the real systemic differences. Gigi, let's take the 20,000 foot view 
talk to me a little bit about what you think credit unions are really getting right right now and what they could improve on. So I think credit unions are really getting right this idea of tripling down on the member focus, the tripling down on where are members right now, what are the pain points, what are they dealing with, and how do we meet them where they are in, in life? Kind of what does that look like from leveraging a credit union's financial services acumen? I think the opportunity is to understand that that is longitudinal work, that that is beyond this crisis, that those that 78% of people living to paycheck was a, was a statistic prior to the pandemic, that people continue to be financially fragile, that people continue to be, the, that there is a huge wealth gap that continues to grow, that there is a disparity um, across different segments, whether again, it be gender or ethnicity. So I think the opportunity for credit unions is to understand that that's really a longitudinal path, that when you work with members, it's the it's the my financial being today and that in 10 years I might start in a way afresh with a new financial challenge. And I'll give you an example of that. So when I was a, a young whippersnapper, I, I boldly went into my credit union and said to them, you know, I'd really like a car loan. 18 years old, no credit score, no job, up on her way, you know, to, to college. And my wonderful loan officer said, a sweetheart, no, no way. You know, you don't have a credit score. You don't have a job. You have no money. And as you go through college, I'm going to work with you to establish the things you need to be able to get a car loan. So it's this idea of, you know, I think I need a car right now. You probably don't. You're okay, but we'll get you a car loan by the time you graduate college. So I give that example, you know, of many, 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 many moons ago, and now sort of come to my present advanced age and realize that I'm in sort of that same very novice potential place as a consumer. Because as I think of caring for my father, I think of, oh my gosh, what if he gets Alzheimer's or what if he needs care? Knowing that, you know, a good place for for any type of care is probably 10,000 to, you know, $15,000 a year. How do I afford that? So there's this, there's very cyclical longitudinal work that credit unions can do in people's life cycle, but also in the micro moments of every day. And so I think the opportunity is one, the logic longitudinal view, and two, the opportunity to look at the micro moments where people are deciding on how to manage their money right now, meaning what card am I going to use to actually pay for the purchases on Amazon? Is it a bank card or is it a credit union card? Am I going to be able to transfer money to Mike who I dearly love as a colleague, but I know he needs 40 bucks because of something. You know, can I do that through Venmo or through Zelle? But does my credit union have an, a, an opportunity for me to do that? So it's this really interesting pairing of the longitudinal view, the technology, and the understanding that everybody right now is thinking about their money all the time. It's not just the big life events anymore. Those are the opportunities I would identify. Mike, same question for you. If you have anything to add, what are credit unions really getting right right now and what could they improve on? Well, as I've mentioned several times already, I think the thing they're getting right is that, you know, they've, they've firmly focused on their mission, getting people through crisis as quickly as possible. And all of the data that we have makes it very clear that that's happening. What I think we're, we're probably not getting right, to piggyback on what uh, Gigi said, I think that credit unions really sort of take for granted what they do in the marketplace. And because of that, they don't talk enough about what they do and the difference that they can make in people's lives. You said it at the beginning of the podcast. I'm not really sure what these institutions do or what they're all about. That's a real problem because what we do and and what we're all about can help Everybody, not just you know people like us, but people that are really in, in dire straits from a financial perspective, and you know more people ought to know about it. For many, it's a life changing relationship. So, I think they could do that better. I would second this idea that often the consumer doesn't really feel supported by financial institutions out in the world. So it is important for us to know because there's so few places you can go where you feel like you become the center of attention and that company place 
institution is actually truly acting as your fiduciary, that they truly have your best interests at hand. And most of us just don't feel that way about the traditional banking system. So I like the fact that I was able to educate myself by researching this episode on something that was always a little bit hazy for me. Gigi, this is probably hazy for other people. Are there a series of questions you can ask yourself to decide whether credit union is right for you, or is it just simply it's right for everybody? Well, so my whole career has been in credit union. So of course I'm going to answer that. I think it's right for everybody, but let me step back and be a little bit perhaps more, more practical. I think first of all, it's, Finances are complex. We realize that, you know, all, all throughout, even opening up an account can be very complex. So I think the first question for consumers is going to be, you know, can I join a credit union? Credit unions are, have what they call fields of membership. In other words, you know, not everybody can join everybody, every credit union, but probably every person can join a credit union in the United States. There are, there are websites, um, Your Money Further, Dot com to check to see where you can go. Can you join a credit union locally? Also, the, the federal regulator, the National Credit Union Administration, NCUA.gov, also has an ability to check to see, can you belong to credit union? So you find out the answer is yes, and then you've got to do just a little research. You've got to do, you've got to use the Google. You know, Google those credit unions and see what they offer, what that looks like, how does that feel for you? And then what I'd say is probably have a conversation pick up the phone, enter, probably not enter a branch right now, but pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody at the credit union on what you want to do with your finances or what problems you're having right now and see what you get. And, and you know, I'm hoping <laughs> that all of those credit unions will say, you know, we're here for you. We can do something and we can help you out. I think of this oftentimes as, the, you know, this great rage around artisanal food, you know, that we all have our local brewer, we have our local baker, and even though Costco might be right down the road, you know, we want that special brewer, that special loaf of bread. Credit unions, I would say, offer artisanal banking. Credit unions really all are about what do you need and what is it, what what can we do for you? And so I think those two, three steps um, that people can do to just kind of see how that all feels uh, is probably the best bet to at least, at least get introduced to the credit union system and see if it's an option uh, for them. Gigi, I like that. Credit unions are artisanal banking. Uh, that has a nice flair to it. Mike, tell me, are there some general misconceptions that the population has about credit unions that just aren't true? I think probably the biggest one is that credit unions are no different than banks. You know, because we offer the same products and services, many of similar solutions, you know, I, I think many people that don't have the experience assume that, you know, it's just another version of that same thing that they're already interacting with. So I think GG hit the nail on the head. I think credit unions collectively have one mission, individually, strategically, the way they, you know, attack that mission and get at it differs. And it differs for a variety of reasons, including the field of membership. No matter what the issue, especially in finance, but no matter what the issue in finance, for example, the best advice that any consumer could ever get is shop around. And this is, you know, yourmoneyfurther.com. That's the place to go. I like to end the conversation here because I think what becomes incredibly apparent is that the goal of credit unions is to serve their members. And by doing so creates a system of banking that can help people when they're in need. And that's become abundantly clear from our conversation. I'd like to end this conversation the way I end every conversation, which is by asking you if people are interested in learning more either from you personally or about credit unions in general. Gigi, where should they go? So they can go lots of places. Certainly they can go to the foundation's website. So ncuf.coop. We are the foundation really for America's credit unions. So really our constituency are the credit unions to help them do more around financial well-being, around living their cooperative values and on disaster relief. So ncuf.coop, my email is there. My contact information is there. So I'll start with that. And Mike, if people want to know more about you, ask you questions or learn about CUNA, how can they do that? 
shirkuna.com and my direct contact information is mshank, M-S-C-H-E-N-K at cuna.com. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Gigi Highland and Mike Shank. That's a wrap. Thank you. I'm going to try something different today, a new segment called Are You an Earner or Investor? This is a community segment where I give feedback about the podcast and we talk about what it means. Today, we're going to hear from MA Travel Dreamer. This is a review I got on Apple iTunes. MA Travel Dreamer says, smart, critical thinker with heart. I already appreciated Doc G's calm and effective interviewing style. Then had even more respect for his frank discussions about the weaknesses of the fire movements because I think it'll make the movement stronger. But what I appreciate most is his vulnerability in sharing about the shame he felt as a physician. As a fellow healthcare provider, I resonated with him deeply. Lower on the totem pole of the hospital's hierarchy, I was sometimes on the receiving end of harsh criticism from physicians, but I've always sensed the deep insecurity and pain beneath that. I've since quit my profession, and if I'm honest, one of my strongest motivators to reach fire is to never have to work in healthcare again. That's a sad thing to admit. It's sad for our patients, it's sad for our healthcare system, and it's sad for the healthcare providers going through the emotional trauma of caring for the sick and dying without enough emotional support. I appreciate that Doc G had the guts and emotional intelligence to speak these hard truths out loud. Fire is not a solution for emotional trauma. I think sometimes we hope it will be. But with some introspection, I think fire can be a wonderful step off of the path of the toxic social norms and onto a path that makes the most of this brief life that we're given. Well, thank you, M.A. Travel Dreamer, for your kind words. You know, when I first read this, I thought you were an earner, right? Because you're in healthcare, this is your job, you were sticking it out because it was a way to make money, maybe even a way to get to fire, financial independence, retire early. But as I read further, I also realize that you are an investor. You are not only investing probably in things like stocks and bonds, maybe even real estate, but you're investing in your life. And let's be honest, we shouldn't spend our lives miserable. Financial independence isn't worth being in a place where you feel disrespected and where you don't enjoy your work at all. That's the thing about earning and investing. You can do them both together. MA Travel Dreamer, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for leaving us feedback and let us know how things go in your new life. I want to talk to you today about a failure. You know, I've noticed that I talk about businesses and things I've done in the past, and I often talk about the successes. But the truth of the matter is there have been just as many, if not more failures, especially in the business realm. So imagine that I am a practicing physician, and I'm getting burned out at my job, and I'm starting to look at my finances and figure out what is my path out of medicine, and I discovered this business idea, which I really loved. You see, I was working as a hospice physician, and one thing we do as hospice physicians is we help people decide when their loved one or a patient themselves is at that point where it no longer makes sense to do active and aggressive medical treatment. We are basically crisis managers, especially at the evaluation point. One thing I've learned is that patients and their families in the hospitals generally don't have an advocate, someone in the medical know who can listen to their issues, sort them out, and help protect the patient and their families. This lack of an advocate became the idea of a business for me, which I called Crisis MD. That's right, Crisis MD. The idea was that I would develop an online presence where people would find me through SEO and search words on Google when they were in the midst of either a medical crisis themselves or their family was in a medical crisis, and they needed emergent help and advocacy Because unlike most of the people I know, they don't have any doctors in their family. So imagine this, you you end up in the ICU or your loved one ends up in the ICU and you have no medical knowledge. Who's going to help sort through what the doctors are telling you, the radiologic studies, all the decisions that have to be made? 
Now, in the old world, it would be the ICU doctors or the primary care physician or some doctor who would step up and translate for you. But we all know that, especially over the last 10 or 20 years, those translators have disappeared. So my idea was CrisisMD. I was going to create this beautiful website. I was going to promote myself on the web. I would give free calls. You know, I'd give a 30-minute informational session to each person when they first called in, and then they could pay a monthly service or a one-time service for me to help them sort out whatever medical issues that they were dealing with at the time, whether it be in a crisis, like a family member was in the ICU, or whether they were dealing with their own chronic medical issues and how to manage them, they could pay me to pretty much do what I was really good at doing, especially being a hospice physician. I was great at taking all the information, summarizing it, translating it, and then helping families use it to make good decisions. I really thought this was a great idea, and in fact, I invested enough money to start an LLC, to patent the name, and to pay someone to create a website. So I was a few thousand dollars in. I started the business, but there were a few things that I hadn't quite figured out. One was that there's this question of by giving advice over the phone or by Zoom or Skype, was I acting as the patient's physician? Because if that was the case, I would need a medical license in every state from which I took phone calls from. Now, granted, that's changed a little bit. I think with COVID, they started allowing people to have national licenses so that they could move from state to state and help take care of COVID patients. But before that, if you wanted to give medical advice to someone in, let's say, the state of Oklahoma, it would be possible that you would need a medical license from the state of Oklahoma. Now, at the time, I only had a medical license in Illinois. The process of getting licensed in each state is different and varied and costly. It could take a year and thousands upon thousands of dollars to actually obtain my licenses in all these other states. The other thing that I didn't realize is It's this thought that, oh, I just make a website and pay someone to SEO optimize it, search engine optimize it, and all of a sudden it's going to be successful and people are going to just find you. It was a wonderful idea, but it didn't really pan out. Uh, People didn't find me by just searching on Google, even though I looked at the keywords and I paid some money to really get help with this website so that we could set it up so that it would be most optimized. But as all of you know, figuring out Google optimization or SEO isn't easy. And I flopped. I tried at this business for six to 12 months. I did some free informational sessions. It was fun. And I thought it was still going to be a great business model. I just felt like that there was a huge number of people throughout the United States who could use this advocacy, but it never took off. So eventually I closed down the website. I probably lost somewhere about three to five thousand dollars in the process. It wasn't huge. I included this as part of my revenue from my medical business. So it was a small part of my yearly revenue that I lost doing this. But it was one of those things that I kind of threw myself in, maybe a half-baked idea, because I hadn't thought it out fully, and just went for it. And you could say, well, that's a failure, and you lost a lot of money, and you didn't have much to show for it. But when I look back, sometimes you just have to throw yourself in. Sometimes you don't know what the roadblocks are going to be until you arrive at them, and you certainly don't know if you'll be able to surpass them or not. You can sit on the sidelines your whole life. You can think up all sorts of great ideas and then come up with every reason that they won't work. Or sometimes you can take a leap and hope that you land well. And that's certainly what I did with this business, and it didn't work out. But if you look at all the businesses that I've been involved with from the time I became an adult till now, enough of them did work out such that I was successful. I made a living. I earned enough money to eventually reach financial independence. None of that would have happened unless I had some of these failures. I don't know if I would have ever started my own medical practice or my own concierge practice unless I had failed enough to know that it was survivable that indeed you can get information and help from other people, and that you can pivot. So I didn't pivot in this crisis MD business, but I did in my medical practice. So 
I had a traditional medical practice, which I did for a number of years, and then eventually I transitioned to a concierge practice in which I had almost no overhead and saw patients in their own homes. So I didn't even have an office, which is one of the most expensive things a doctor has to pay for. I didn't have many employees. I pretty much just had someone who answered the phone and managed the practice. I really cut my costs down to such an extent that almost every dollar that came into the practice, I was able to pocket. I wouldn't have had any idea how to do any of these things if I hadn't tried businesses and failed before. These were the stepping stones that allowed for my ultimate success. So if you're out there and if you're afraid to try, my suggestion to you is try in a such a way that there are low stakes. So maybe you don't spend three to five thousand dollars starting a business. Maybe you start your own business for five hundred dollars. You put in a little bit of time and build your own website as opposed to having someone do it for you. You research some of the work yourself instead of paying for it. But if you can create these low stakes failures, ultimately I really think they will lead to eventual successes. And I think that's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is fail over and over and over again, and in the process of getting back up, you'll learn things that will eventually lead to your success. That's certainly what we try to teach here on Earn and Invest, and I hope that's what you glean when you listen to all the panelists and interviews that I do. None of these people got to where they were by being afraid to fail. All of them only succeeded after they failed at something or other. So why not you? What have you tried and not succeeded at? What has been your most recent failure? And more importantly, what did you learn? Awesome. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. I thought we were able, I I hope, from my standpoint, I feel like we got a lot of good information out of there. Was there anything you feel like we missed or that you wanted to add in? My end, plus we really covered the the waterfront from my perspective. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, it was was pretty comprehensive, I thought. And at a pretty good level. Yeah, and I think think it'll be very informative for people because I think it does answer that kind of basic question why credit unions? Like, why should I be interested? Why should I be involved? And I think you both are very fluent in describing how it is a very member-centered organization uh, that steps into the breach, that supports people at the hardest times. And uh, I think that's a message that will resonate with people.